This is Talking Drupal, a weekly chat about web design and development from a group of people with one thing in common. We love Drupal. This is episode 316, Accessibility. Welcome to Talking Drupal. Today we're talking about accessibility with Rain Brea Michaels. Rain is an interaction designer on Google's central accessibility team. She's a certified professional in web accessibility. She serves as a co-creator, uh, sorry, co-facilitator of the W3C Cognitive Accessibility Task Force. That sounds intense. And is one of the accessibility topic maintainers for Drupal Core. Rain, welcome to the show and thank you for joining us. Thank you. I'm John Picozzi, and today my co-hosts are joining us again, filling in the co-host seat for a one week only appearance, Chad Hester. Chad is an experienced uh, enterprise technical consultant, currently working with ImageX as a senior business analyst. Chad, welcome to the show. Yeah, thanks for having me again. What's going on with you this week, Chad? Uh, well, I... Um was hoping for our contractors to be done. So if you hear any noise in the background, I'll, I'll be muting as much as possible. <laughs> we have somebody painting right outside my door um, and that will probably continue for another week or so uh, in preparation for us to, well, first enjoy our house and then turn around and sell it probably next spring. And uh, after that, we're gonna immigrate to Canada as we mentioned before. Um, and I guess uh, in the spirit of National Disability Employment Awareness Month, uh, I wanted to uh, share that um, after 20 years of not taking any pharmaceutical medication for ADHD, I'm giving that another test. Um, I think my biggest blockers in that are just staying focused, not getting distracted, and more importantly, ADHD makes people avoid under-stimulating tasks. So now mm -hmm. those, those tasks at work that I just dread, I just go right into. Uh, so that's, hmm. that's been good. The, the, the difficult or challenging part that I've noticed is it really requires a lot of discipline and a good routine to get the most out of that. So something that I'm watching, hmm. but I, I feel like I'm in a really good place for being able to try that out. So uh, Chad, just to clarify, you, you were mm -hmm. not on meds and now you are trying meds. Yep. Uh, I, okay. I had a relatively traumatic childhood, longer story for another day. Uh, and um, it didn't really take well because I just wasn't in the right place, uh, to be receptive to it. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, I, I've done a lot of accommodations over the past 20 years. Uh, I think my career is in of itself an accommodation, you know, I'm just all over the place. Agency life is actually oddly, uh, fitting for my brain, but, uh, I still ran into a few issues. You know, I still have a strong routine. I get good exercise. I do yoga. I, uh, you know, take supplements. I eat good meals. My wife, thank God, is a great cook. So that certainly helps. Uh, but still running into a few walls. And I, I talked to um, a cognitive behavioral therapist about this. And she kind of pushed me in that direction a little bit to say, hey, why not try it out before you go through this big move that you're having? So you say your career is an accommodation. I say it's an accomplishment. <laughs> I think, I think, you know, you've, you've <laughs> worked you, hard to get where you are and, um, you know, you are, uh, a, a role model in my opinion. I appreciate that. Thank you. Rain, what's going on with you this week? So we went pumpkin picking with our kids nice. this weekend. That was quite a lot of fun. Uh, although, uh, my son is very particular about what pumpkins look like. So he was a little, unnerved by the fact that when you go into a real pumpkin patch, they have a variety of shapes, sizes, and colors. Mm -hmm. So that was interesting. Um, we also got to take a look at the pumpkin patch. They had um, this sort of bug and lizard and reptile exhibit that was wonderful. It was so neat. But we found a walking leaf in there. And at oh, first so cool. we couldn't find it because we were looking for something smallish. And then suddenly I realized that the entire plant that we were looking at was actually the walking leaf. They are enormous. And that really surprised me. Well, um, Rain, just like here, are, are you in, are you in California or are you? Yes, we're, uh, we're in California. I was going to say um, last time we had somebody from California and we were talking about bugs too. It's interesting. Bananas, <laughs> legs. Con continue. We like bugs. No. <laughs> 
Um, so I just wanted to show this, I'll follow up on Chad's uh, intro. Uh, I very recently learned that I'm autistic. Um, and I learned that really because of my own son's diagnosis and sort of learning through him and really learning that autism itself does not always present in any of the stereotypical ways that we expect. So it mm -hmm. really did take me until adulthood to learn this. It also tends to present differently for women than it does for men. So it's highly underdiagnosed. Um, but one of the accommodations, one of the pieces of assistive technology that I use is, and I'm holding up on the screen right now, something called a time timer. And the reason why I'm holding this up is because Chad actually has one behind him as well. Um, these are special timers. So if anyone is uh, finding that um, sort of sensory overload or focusing on tasks, is something that you're challenged with, um, that, that you would like a little extra help with. These time timers are really special because they're, uh, they're not really a clock, they're just a dial, they're very simple. And then you dial in how long you're meant to focus for. And you can see the time go down visually, so you don't actually have to sort of look at the number, you just kind of have a sense of how much time is left. And then I turned off the sound, but at the end it'll beep at you to tell you that you've reached that time. And if you set them for very small chunks, like five minutes a piece, um, it can really help you get into, as Chad called them, those under-stimulating tasks that you need to accomplish. Maybe you need to do a code review, or maybe you need to do something maybe you've been avoiding because it's particularly difficult. And, uh, and you know that you're going to find yourself ex experiencing mental fatigue. If you just give yourself five minutes, then oftentimes you can find that at the end of those five, you can give yourself another five and then another five and you can actually start to make progress. So these are hmm. really useful. Do, do you find yourself like increasing the time before it beeps or do you like it beeps and you go, oh, I, I can actually spend another 10 minutes on this and, and setting it again? So that's an excellent question. One of my own personal challenges can be hyper-focus. And uh, this is also something that can be experienced with ADHD. Um, we, we often think of ADHD as an inability to focus, but that's not actually true. It can be um, when something's understimulating, it can be inability to focus. And then when it's overstimulating, you get into hyperfocus. And, and something similar happens with, uh, with autism. So for me, sometimes the beeping, I, I, to answer your question, I don't always notice that it's about to end because I get into hyperfocus. And so for me, sometimes that beeping is actually just a reminder that I need to get up or I need to eat. <laughs> mm. I need to sort of take a moment and stop um, mm. so, that, so that I don't go too long until it becomes a, a bad thing. Interesting. Wow. That's you, you guys have uh, literally in the first 10 minutes of not even five minutes of the show here, you've, you've educated me so much. I, I find that, um, I find that super interesting and yeah, that seems like that would be super helpful, especially if you, you know, either hyper-focused or, or just want to kind of get through a mundane task. You're like, listen, I only got like two more minutes. I can do this. Um, Rain, I do have one question, not necessarily about the time timer but um what is what is your son's perception of a, of a pumpkin just out of curiosity is it like the picturesque perfect like round pumpkin or is it like something different no that's a wonderful question and yes he has he, he's an excellent artist hmm. and so he's drawn thousands of pumpkins in his short life mm -hmm. and they're all hmm. sort of perfectly shaped um you know those sort of cinderella uh, Cinderella yeah. coach pumpkins with the, gotcha. the perfect stem. Yeah. Gotcha. So, so a real pumpkin patch must've been a, a mind blowing experience for him. It was <laughs> Nick. Welcome to the show. Number 316. <laughs> you made it buddy. Uh, what's thanks, going on thanks, with you? Thanks for having me back. <laughs> uh, on, on a bit of a letter side. Um, I just want to say, I got a small piece of tech this week that I'm excited about. Um, which is not the tech that I was talking about earlier in the show, but I got a capture card. And so it's, so I, I'm, I'm thinking about streaming some things or recording some things directly to the computer with a much nicer camera. 
So I'm, I'm kind of excited about it. I got a couple of projects in mind for a vacation that's coming up and I haven't, uh, haven't played with anything like this in a while. So I'm kind of excited. So, um, I would just like to say when you become a TikTok star, please remember us little people <laughs> and how you started on this, this, this small podcast about Drupal. <laughs> Uh, so for me, uh, I have been, um, <laughs> I apparently jam packed October with a bunch of, um, speaking and events, which is a little bit refreshing because I haven't been doing a ton of that, um, over the last year or so. Uh, so tomorrow, which will be last Wednesday when, when folks hear this, uh, we will be giving a keynote at GovCon. So Steve and Nick and I will be, will be the keynote speakers at GovCon. But then in, uh, let's see, two weeks, I believe, um, the week of the 26th, I believe it is, Acquia Engage will be happening, uh, and I will be manning EPAM's booth at Acquia Engage and uh, leading uh, Ask Me Anything uh, in our networking lounge. So if you happen to be at Acquia Engage, stop on by. And then that same week, I will be participating in a DevOps summit at the New York Drupal Camp. So if you are attending New York Drupal Camp, you can also uh, stop by the DevOps Summit and uh, and say hi. Congrats, John. That I know. sounds like a, a load. <laughs> it is, you know, and it's funny. Personally, I'm also coaching my son's fall ball baseball team. Um, which is two times a week with games on Saturday. So like, I'm really just working towards the end of October. Once October's over, I'm going to, you know, sleep for most of November, probably, probably not, but it's a nice idea. <laughs> anyway, let's move on to our module of the week. Chad, tell us about clean talk. Yeah. So um, I have a client uh, who has actually a couple of websites uh, that we're currently building. Uh, it was built in Ruby on Rails, just a massive uh, set of functionality. And one of the things is, is you know, a lot, a, an enormous forum. So he uses a Kismet right now. And mm -hmm. I, I just started looking into, okay, is, is that even possible? And it didn't really look stable. So I, I came across uh, an article that Jeff Geerling wrote maybe about two, three years ago. And he mentions, you know, the days of Malum a uh, long since end of life, of course. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, I recall that, that was actually a really good module and I, I used it in my own forums for a while, but he came across uh, something called Clean Talk, and it is uh, a paid service that does, it doesn't cost much uh, from what I see, but it does work with a ton of platforms, including Drupal. There's a stable Drupal module called, wait for it, Clean Talk, <laughs> uh, that, that's worth taking a look at. Um, it's stable all the way through nine, uh, which yep. was pleasantly surprising. So it's something that we'll we'll try out. I didn't see anything that was a stronger fit. So kudos to uh, Jeff Geerling for doing his homework. I will say that one website, $8 a year, seems very reasonable as far as a price uh, goes. Or you can pay $15 a month for unlimited websites. So... That's interesting. And also I will say for anybody that was wondering, there is no dirty talk module in Drupal. I just looked it up. So I say do that Google search. <laughs> I think it's interesting too, because it's been around for so long. Like the original module, I think was released in 2013. So it's, it's definitely stable. It's a service that's been around for a long time. So I'll, I'll be checking it out as well. I, I'm a former Mullen user too. I, so I wonder how long ago was Malum uh, created and why did Malum take off as opposed to, to this? Well, Malum was created by Trees and someone else. So I think it had a bit of a hand up there and it was created, yeah. well, it must've been more than 10 years ago. So maybe it was, yeah, it was first, first on the scene. Okay. Well, that answers yeah. that question. Cool. That's super useful. I'm going to put that in my, my bag of tricks and, and pull that out at some point when I need it. So we are here to talk about accessibility. And, you know, I think the first question here is why uh, talk about accessibility um, and, and, you know, why is it important to you guys? Yeah, I, I think... Rain and I probably share a couple of personal <laughs> reasons as to why it's important. On my side, I 
I've always been fascinated personally by um, things like visual impairments. You know, uh, when I was young, I used to try to uh, more, more than just empathize, but rather practice what would it be like to live without vision? And I think that early kind of empathy really helped me understand, you know, what sort of accommodations people have to really endure. And as I got into technology, um, that became that much more important. Um, I remember, here's your first book recommendation here, John. <laughs> uh, the Design of Everyday Things was a, a book that really highlighted the, the fact that accessibility really is just usability in disguise. It's, is this usable by everybody? And that's just good design practice. Uh, so, so I think that's what it really meant to me. How about you, Ray? Yeah, for me, it, it's really, it's a human rights issue. Um, when we're talking about accessibility, we're talking about, we're, we're genuinely talking about one in four people in the world. Um, if we're talking just about cognitive accessibility, which is the largest uh, kind of disability category in the world, uh, we're talking about a 12% of the world's population at minimum. And that's today. We're not necessarily talking about, uh, you know, right now the, the UN projects that one in six people, or is it the World Health Organization? Uh, one of those projects that by 2050, one in six people in the world will be over the age of 65. And by the time we reach 65, we have natural cognitive changes. It's, it's part of who we are. Some of those are strengths that, uh, that increase over time. And some of those are differences that in the way that the world operates right now, become barriers to our ability to function independently. Uh, and I'm, I'm not necessarily, I mean, in some cases, these barriers um, may for an individual be a, a genuine disabling experience. But in many of these cases, they are only disabling because of the way that the world is built. And the, uh, the digital world is increasingly, especially now that we're in a time of COVID when things are going remote, uh, the digital world is where exceptionally important things are happening. It's where you schedule your doctor's appointment. It's where you get mm -hmm. your COVID vaccine scheduled. It's, it's how you make sure that your thermometer is set at the right temperature, um, which is not just a, a comfort concern, it's actually a genuine safety concern. Um, so, for me, this is this is really what accessibility is, and I've been in this space, um, you know, in, in my early days in Drupal, and nearly 20 years ago. Um, I feel so old now, um, <laughs> but you know, I was probably the person kind of annoying others, saying we have to think about accessibility, we have to think about accessibility, and the reason for that is because I was born into. Uh, accessibility advocacy. My mother is blind. Uh, she's a single mother. Um, and I sort of came into existence because my mother met my father at um, some of the protests that led to the passage of the ADA. So mm -hmm. the community that was around me just growing up is an accessibility community. It's accessibility advocates. And, it, you know, I, I sort of knew from my earliest days of existence that disability is more of a construct. Ability and disability are more of a construct based on the way that the world is built, not an actual measure of somebody's ability to hmm. be a full and wonderful human being. Wow. So that that you know that's a you know obviously accessibility is a much larger topic, right? Like we could we could spend, you know, the next hundred podcasts talking about the, the whole world of accessibility, you know, but today our goal is to um, specifically gear that or gear our conversation towards developers. Can uh, Rain, can you talk a little bit as to why like developers specifically need to focus on accessibility? Absolutely. So we, um, I, I'm an interaction designer now at, at Google and don't do as much developing anymore as I used to, um, but I, I used to be a Drupal developer and used to do a lot of coding. And um, we often sort of perceive accessibility in two categories when we're thinking about 
uh, when we're thinking about it from the perspective of building a digital product of some kind. Mm -hmm. We either think about it as something that the designer or the interaction designer needs to sort of think about and, and plan for in the way that something is designed. Um, or we think about it as something that we need to do at the end of a project to go through all the testing and make sure that the code is accessible. The problem is that the implementation is where accessibility can actually function and, and be made available or not. And it doesn't matter how good a designer's designs are if in the actual implementation of those designs, accessibility isn't considered right from the beginning. And the cost of retrofitting for accessibility can be so burdensome that often teams will have to make very uh, harsh decisions about what's going to be made accessible or not because budget uh, considerations, time considerations, um, and, and so it ultimately creates products that aren't very accessible when it's left to the very end. What happens is at that moment, at that sort of critical moment where designs are passed over to uh, an engineer or developer to actually implement, is now the engineer has to make decisions about how to structure their code, how to structure the document object model, um, whether to use uh, something called ARIA, which I'm sure we'll talk more about, or to use HTML5 and landmarks, um, what choices to make in terms of JavaScript, uh, the, the engineer also has to make certain choices about how that code, like when that code comes in through tokens, uh, what's dynamic, what's not dynamic, how are those tables built. These are all decisions that typically happen after code, uh, sorry, after designs are turned over to an engineer. And these choices will make or break that accessibility. Um, they will also impact whether or not the code and the, and the ultimate product is accessible to assistive technology and whether or not it is open to personalization. Um, that's a, at that point, but there's also actually an earlier stage that we also forget, which is when the designers or, or even before designers get involved, uh, at a certain point, there's decisions like, um, you know, usually a designer isn't involved in a project before the decision to use Drupal is made. Sometimes even certain modules may have been selected before the designer is even involved. And those decisions right there, the decision to use Drupal instead of something else, the decision to use certain modules or uh, to have the sort of overall information architecture of the project itself, those will also impact accessibility. But if you don't think about accessibility at that point, you can make critically difficult decisions to correct later on. It's interesting. So the question was specifically why we're, we're focusing on developers, but you, you have single-handedly made me realize as an architect, I need to, I need to be thinking about accessibility as well. Uh, one of the reasons why I, I, really honed in on this topic as well is as we're starting to take a look at it more in you know the various companies that I work with, it, it really is an afterthought in a lot of cases, especially in the agency world. It's like, you know, install the user user experience, install the accessibility. It, it's it's an afterthought. Um, and I think part of that isn't so much just the uh, stakeholders who are really invested in the outcome of this but also the team that is meant to execute on these things. And I don't think there's anything nefarious about it. Uh, I don't think it's deliberate, but I think that it's a lack of familiarity, a lack of enthusiasm for this being uh, something. So usually the first people that I encounter who have a sensitivity to accessibility on teams is exactly what Rain said, designers and QA testers, but less so developers themselves. And I feel like that is a big missing piece from this. And if we can, make it familiar, make it more comfortable for developers, I feel like they bring a lot more tools to the toolkit, uh, then it can be an earlier, um, a planned thing where they're participating in the process more readily. It's actually interesting that you say that, Chad, because when um, I was working as a, an account manager at Oomph, that was one of the things that we would always ask in our, in our sales process. You know, is accessibility, you know, a priority here? If so, what level? Because we knew that there was going to be cost associated with, you know, 
obviously we were writing accessible code, but there was going to be a cost associated with testing to verify that we hit that level at the end of the project and testing throughout. Um, so it, it's interesting to, to hear that you, you're seeing a lot of agencies not thinking about that because, you know, from a, from a sales standpoint, it, it shows one that we're we're thinking about you know everybody we're thinking about a, a whole a whole project right not just like hey buy this thing um, but two you know I think it it shows that like you know the development team is thinking about that as they're building it they're trying to build they're trying to build with accessibility in mind but knowing that sometimes the business goals just don't match up with that and and I think that's kind of a little bit of where the problem lies too. Yeah. yeah. So b before we move on to the next question, I, I wanted to circle back to something that you mentioned, Rain, uh, a little bit earlier. You mentioned um, cognitive disability, uh, and it made me uh, wonder, what are the different kind of classes of disability that you need to account for? And could you give us like maybe a, a really brief definition of each as we're going through this topic today? Sure. Uh, brief is very challenging in that, <laughs> in that question, but... Um, I'll do my best and just keep in mind that this is truly um, sort of a broad statement that there, there's a huge amount of nuance in between. Uh, the ones that people are typically most aware of are vision and motor. So vision is, is also more nuanced than uh, we often realize. A lot of times when people think of vision in the context of accessibility, uh, they think of screen readers. But there are far more people who may have vision differences and vision challenges uh, or be semi-eyes free um, who do have some vision and do rely on some of that vision. So there's a kind of a, a large sort of low vision experience that is very different from a screen reader, a full on screen reader experience. Uh, so that's one kind of large class to think about. Another class to think about in, in the motor space, so uh, we're thinking about everything from uh, somebody who maybe has tremors, and so it's a little bit difficult for them to uh, sort of execute fine motor tasks, all the way to somebody who does not have physical mobility, um, and perhaps their device is mounted in landscape mode, and they're using either their eyes or some kind of a sip and puff device to interface with the uh, with whatever it is that they're um, looking at or using. Uh, then uh, I'm gonna miss some because my, my brain is full right now. Um, there's the hearing space. So the hearing space is also uh, to be deaf or to have limited hearing, or maybe there are certain tonal ranges that you cannot hear. Um, and I'm missing a really huge one right now. Um, but then there's the, there's five and then there's the cognitive space. I feel quite embarrassed that I'm missing one right now. Um, and then the cognitive space is really broad as well um, because this covers everyone from uh, sort of the, the large class of people who consider themselves neurodiverse, who may have different ways of thinking or operating um, all the way through individuals who might have traumatic brain injury and um, experience sort of uh, moments of, uh, of memory challenges or memory differences, uh, things like neurodegenerative conditions where somebody is um, very dramatically changing in their cognitive, uh, sort of how they perceive the world cognitively and how they interact and what they remember. Um, so it's that's, and that, uh, all of these are also impacted by situational uh, experiences. So uh, something as simple as being distracted in the moment um, or having uh, being in a outdoor space where there's a lot of glare, so you're not able to see things quite as well. Uh, this is also a very kind of large and, and real space for accessibility as well. I think one of the key takeaways here is, and something that I myself have to remember quite often too, is many people think of making something accessible accessible is black and white, like mm -hmm. whereas all the different types of um, disability, it's a range, it's a spectrum, you know, and making something more accessible means making it so anybody, wherever they lay on that spectrum 
able to use your and access your content. Um, so, so thank you for that. Um, one of the things that I see kind of related to John's comments earlier with projects and, and related to what you were saying about where it kind of falls is people will finish a, nearly finish a project and say, okay, now we need to make it accessible, get some report done, and then realize that it's far more involved to rework everything to make it truly accessible. And so then they just do workarounds to get it to pass the test. They don't really worry about truly making it accessible. They just want to make sure that all the automated tests pass is accessible. Um, why is this a dangerous precedent? Why is this something that should be avoided? Oh, there's so much to unpack here. Uh, <laughs> so Deep the questions. first, yes, the first problem with taking this approach is that if you're relying on automated testing, you're really only able to catch about 30% of your potential accessibility barriers within your tool. And, um, and even those are somewhat suspect, you know, and uh, an automated test can determine whether or not, for example, you have alt text, but it cannot determine if that alt text is useful um, and, and meaningful. And so, um, and, and sometimes, you know, automated tests can also check for color contrast challenges. But sometimes those color contrast challenges that it will pick up or, or the things that it will pass are because there's something strange going on in the code and it's not necessarily actually seeing what's really happening on the screen. And those are the pretty straightforward ones from the things that, um, that automated tests are, are really kind of good at being able to capture. Even those aren't going to ever be 100%. You really, truly need a human, uh, the human in the loop, as, as we like to call it. You need that human to, to look, to, um, to use their experience. And, and you kind of need a diverse set of humans to use their experience and, and check it. So that's really one, one thing. Another thing that's exceptionally dangerous if you're sort of relying on um, just kind of fixing things to pass a test is that what you're doing is you're looking at sp specific elements within your code. So you're saying, okay, well, you know, this form, I have this form that the user needs to fill out. So I'm gonna fix this form because the form isn't accessible. But what you miss in just focusing on that and, and maybe getting that to be accessible is maybe you miss that somebody who's a screen reader user can't actually get to the form in the first place. Or maybe you miss that when they submit the form, they go to another screen that somebody who doesn't have access to working memory, that sort of memory that you keep in, in your mind as you're going from one screen to the next, uh, won't actually be able to realize where they came from and what they're supposed to do next, because now you have a screen that, that doesn't give them that information. Um, so oh, that is very much a, a big problem that as a developer, you can create when you're just testing for specific elements and not really looking at the whole sort of getting the user from point A to point Z in that flow uh, to make sure that, that everything is accessible along the way. Uh, and then <laughs> another big problem that happens when you do it this way is that you end up using hacks to solve your accessibility fails. You end up using ARIA where a landmark or HTML5 would be better. And uh, while ARIA is wonderful, if you're using it inappropriately, it can actually make the overall experience less accessible rather than more accessible because now you're inappropriately using tools that the machine is meant to understand a specific way. On that note. What is ARIA? <laughs> <laughs> yes, that's a that's an important one to clarify. So some of the most important for, from a developer's perspective, some of the most important things to have in mind are ARIA, the DOM, and HTML5 landmarks. And so ARIA itself, ARIA A R I A comes from the Web Accessibility Initiative, and it stands for Accessible Rich Internet Applications. And I actually have to read that because I don't keep that in my memory. Um, and what it is, is it's a way for, uh, the ARIA are basically a set of attributes 
that you can add to your code that can help when no other option is available for ensuring that assistive technology is able to properly read or properly process and um, sort of then make the right output for whatever it is that's being experienced. So for example, for a screen reader to be able to know that something is a live region that needs to be announced in the moment to a screen reader user because there's no other way for a screen reader user to know that there's something new on the screen and, and they have to know about it. Uh, so ARIA is meant to be kind of a, a tool. It's very powerful. It's wonderful that it exists. And if you're trying to, to look it up, if you go to the um, W3C, W3C.org, and you look for Way Aria, W A I dash A R I A, you'll find a ton of resources that will really help you understand how Aria works, what it's meant for. Um, and really, what, what you should think of it as, and the only thing that you should think of it as, is a way to open up knowledge about how somebody's supposed to interact with the, uh, the tool. If they're using assistive technology or different kinds of user agents that uh, may not use typical browser output. Do you have other do you have other examples of assistive technology? Because uh, I admit when I think of assistive technology, usually it's a screen reader. Um, what other types of programs or devices will will use Aria? Um, so a, a lot of assistive technology will use Aria in interesting ways. Um, something that uses voice input. So um, for hands-free users, hands-free users who might use their, their voice to dictate or interact with their interfaces, um, a voice input is currently considered assistive technology. Uh, that could be dictation or, or other types of, of inputs. Um, screen reader is obviously a big one, but then there's also a lot of text to speech and speech to text, also kind of voice input. So uh, text to speech isn't necessarily going to be a, um, a screen reader per se. It, it might just be using a specific uh, set of text that needs to be spoken out loud. Um, knowing how or what aspects of that text to grab, um, being able to look at the accessibility tree and figure out what should be impacted. Um, a lot of personalization is also uh, impacted and, and made use of by various assistive technologies. So um, changes to fonts, to colors, things like that can also uh, okay. be impacted. Um, and that's, that's just the surface. There's also switch yeah. devices. So Switch, not, not talking about the Nintendo Switch. <laughs> But um, actually talking about, I have a couple of very lightweight switches right here that uh, I use for testing. Um, and these are just buttons that are coded to uh, trigger some kind of action on some of my devices. Um, hmm. my, my husband is not uh, really a, an AT user for accessibility needs, but he has set up a very impressive array of switch devices for himself so that he can modulate uh, sounds. He does a lot of sound work and he can modulate those sounds with switch devices. Uh, so um, that's the other thing. Assistive technology also has non-accessibility use cases, quite a lot of them. I'm wondering in, in your mind, um, is uh, you know a voice assistant like a, a Siri or you know the Amazon one that I'm not going to say because it's right over there and it'll go on. Um, are those considered assistive technologies in your in your mind? So they can be. Um, they they definitely in, in that case, I, I would say yes, although I think some people would say no. Um, I would say yes, because we are, we have implemented them in our lives as assistive tools, as of assistive technology. And there are quite a lot of people out there using them as assistive technology. So there are people, um, you know, the, the, the various voice based products that are out there 
Um, there are people who are using them because they they themselves can't, for example, uh, leave their bed easily. Mm -hmm. And so they have their um, smart homes set up that will control their blinds, control their lights, uh, sure. change their thermostat. So they, in that case, they are very much using that as assistive technology. Mm -hmm. And a lot of these tools, also captioning tools, a lot of these tools that uh, we build, that we create when we're creating software, when we're working in operating systems, creating apps or creating websites, um, we are relying very much on that information that's in the accessibility tree. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and ARIA is very much one of those tools. So along with ARIA, you had mentioned the term landmarks. Um, I'm assuming you're not talking about like the Golden Gate Bridge and the Statue of Liberty. Can you just uh, tell the listeners what's meant by the term landmarks in reference to accessibility? So, yes, they're, they're not quite as fun, but they're very practical. Um, so landmarks in accessibility, uh, well, landmarks in HTML, it, this isn't even an accessibility conversation. This is really just simple, good HTML5. Um, HTML5 has landmarks like nav, N-A-V, which you can use to indicate to the browser where the navigation is, where's that menu. Um, you have your various section landmarks, you have aside landmarks. So these are ways to mark up elements within your content to ensure that anything that's trying to parse the code can understand where some of these key items are. And uh, the, you know, the easiest example is a screen reader user, but also a, a switch access user might want very quick access to the uh, the navigation elements, and they might want to be able to move between specific navigations uh, navigation elements within your page. So you might have a navigation element that's named as the main navigation. You might have a navigation element that's named as your sitemap. And by doing this, you have given the assistive. You, you've not only sort of created good code that will withstand the test of time. But you've also created something that assistive technology is able to recognize and then able to pull forward when people want those tools. Uh, the, same tr the same thing is true of marking the main content within your page with the landmark of main. And that one is probably the most important of all because otherwise you leave assistive technology users potentially having to go through 80 to 200 clicks just to get to your main content. Um, clicks, presses, sips and puffs, uh, eye gaze movements, whatever it is they're using. And that can be so tedious that they will genuinely just give up because it's it's just too much work. Um, it really makes so you that, think, you know, you know, put yourself in that person's shoes, right? If it's two clicks for you, maybe it's, you know, 30 other movements for, you know, for somebody else. Um, I will say I, in the show notes, I did a, um, a quick Google search on HTML5 landmarks and the W3C has a lovely page that tells you some of the landmarks and even lets you toggle them on and off on the page so you can see examples. So that'll be, uh, that'll be in the show notes because mm, I think that's, that's cool and it's topical. I think this, this crosses over into those examples, like what you're saying, Rain, of things that web developers really should be doing for everybody. Uh, examples of strong design patterns that not just help with the direction of accessibility, but kind of like the, um, I love the example of the OXO Good Grips brand. They could have made that for people who had arthritis and things like that and marketed it in that direction. But it was a classic example of good design that benefits everyone. So, you know, the, the marketing label good grips is, well, everybody can grip this thing. Um, I think the, the real push there though, is if developers have tools in their toolkit that go beyond just checking the box, does this do this thing to the, does this do this thing very well and accommodate a larger audience, if not an entire audience, it's design, not, uh, what is it? The separate but equal sort of uh, approach. But the, 
true equality, like everybody's using the same thing where it's possible. I'm really glad you brought up that term that goes back to what I was expressing earlier is that this is a human rights issue mm -hmm. and separate is never equal. It's just not ever going to happen that separate will be equal. So if you are creating separate experiences in order to quote unquote, accommodate other people, those people will always have a lesser experience. Even if at the outset, it, it may work okay for them, over time, that separate experience is going to decrease in priority for the organization maintaining it because it's impossible to keep maintaining two things at the same level. So it's really important to keep that in mind when, when you set out and to not create some kind of other space to let somebody in. Um, a, a wonderful example that comes up over and over again in accessibility talks, but is so, so true, is if you have stairs going up to the front door of the, um, you know, of, of a, a building where decisions are made, and then your wheelchair ramp is this just ramp, this sort of out of the way ramp through the back door, you've already made the person who has to use that feel like they're not invited and they're not part of the, mm. those decisions that are being made. You've already left them out before they've even entered the building to try to become part of that conversation. And so separate is never equal. Yeah, I mean, and not to bring it back to like, you know, dollars and cents, but I think, I think developer, like the project owners, right? need to be aware that they need to be thinking of this, but also they need to be working with the development teams that are um, using, you know, using these standards and, and building their code that way. Right. So, you know, there are, um, it, it brings me, brings me back and this is, this is going to, going to date me, but like, this brings me back to the conversation people used to have about responsive uh, websites and responsive design. Right. And like, is that in budget? Um, or, you know, is it a line item on your, on your, your invoice of like, Hey, we built this responsibly. Um, and I think, you know, accessibility is kind of in this weird space where it's, a line item sometimes, but in reality, it should just be best practice or, or it is best practice and should be done. And, you know, I'm not saying that, hey, we need to get to, um, you know, double A, uh, you know, double uh, A accessibility level. But, uh, you know, I think just as simply as including, um, you know, including these landmarks in your markup, right? The, you know, you're building it build it the best way for everybody to be able to use. Yeah, absolutely. I, and I, I like something that you said in there um, about building it, really building it in the best way. What it comes down to is building something to be accessible and building with the best code that you can really understanding how HTML5 is designed to be written mm -hmm. and sticking with that as much as possible rather than trying to use workarounds or trying to be creative in how you're structuring that code, that will get you most of the way to an accessible product mm -hmm. without any extra work at all. And I think that's really where we experience the biggest challenges is that when people are in a hurry, uh, when they're thinking about budgets or, or they're just kind of scrambling to put something in, which I, I used to work, you know, now I'm, I'm very happy to be at Google. I used to work in the agency life and I completely understand those burdens and that reality. And, and I have utmost empathy for developers who are in that position and having to make those choices. But the second that you're faced as a developer with making those choices of trying to find some quick hack to get you around rather than going back to just simple, solid, good code, that's when you start to break your accessibility. That should be a, be a red flag to you as well, right? Like, hey, um, I should talk to the client because this is gonna, could potentially lead to a lawsuit down the road. We don't need to get into the legalities and how that, and you know, how things go down that road, but you know, uh, 
I used to, when, when in the agency life, I used to work with clients that were like, Hey, we just got sued and we need to, you know, we need to fix our website now. And, you know, building the code, coding it right, coding it the best way you can from the get-go can, can avoid some of that. That's the uh, proactive versus reactive. But uh, I think to really ride that home, it's the total cost of ownership. You know, you build something good, that's two standards. Someone that inherits that work later on because it happens, um, bus factor or otherwise, uh, whoever inherits that code, if it is to standard, then they can pick it up much more easily than some sort of hackish thing that they really need to sift through. I'm sure we've all dealt with the spaghetti code mess. I think we've both dealt with it and we've both produced it at some point in our careers. That's yep. fair. Um, yeah. So, so bringing this back to Drupal for a second, um, because obviously accessibility has far broader application than just Drupal. Um, I think the community as a whole kind of takes pride in the fact that it, it's always improving on accessibility where it can. And I mean, there are huge strides between major versions, four to five, five to six and, and beyond. I, I'm curious um, what your thought, and, and obviously it's very theme specific, um, but what are your thoughts on kind of how Drupal handles accessibility, both as a project and um, its code base? That's a, that's a good question. And as one of the core maintainers for accessibility, this is my opportunity to really make the plea. <laughs> um, Drupal is amazing in how it handles accessibility because the community cares. Um, we have, uh, the reason why I've been part of this community for such a long time is because this is a group of largely developers, um, uh, though there are other people as well, who really believe that information should be available to everyone. And Drupal is such a great tool to do that with because we can build almost anything with Drupal. And, um, and that's, that's so wonderful and so empowering. But it also means that when people are creating contributed modules, or contributed themes or uh, start getting involved in core, that many of these people who get involved, they really believe in making code a, a better, you know, making a better code system and, and building something that will help everyone. Um, but there's also, it's too much for any person to know. I mean, I'm obviously very much embedded in accessibility and, and I have a huge amount of knowledge but there's still so much that I don't know because it's such a huge field. And so what we need are more people. We need more people to get involved in looking at the items that are tagged, the, the contributed modules, the core contributions, the, the core modules, just the core project, everything. We need people who no, just a little bit. You don't need to know a lot, just a little bit about accessibility to take on the challenge of one of those issues that's tagged in the issue queue and start working through it. Um, we have some projects that people, a lot of people use that have accessibility issues that are now years old because there's really, there's just not enough of us and <laughs> there's so much knowledge to be had. And, um, so that would be my plea to the community and where the community really has the opportunity to grow. I think we are a community that cares. I see a lot of people trying to learn, taking advantage of uh, opportunities like this very podcast to try to learn more and try to do better. I believe very strongly that Drupal is very much a community that does the best it can with what it knows in the moment and then does better when it knows better. And um, so, that's my perception. I think we are we are doing really well, but we have a lot of room to improve. And mostly that room to improve just comes from human resources and people being willing to get it wrong and being called out for getting it wrong and, and not being worried about that because that's how we're going to improve accessibility. Um, the, the Olivero project, has been a really good example of this, as has the, the Claro project, two theme-based projects that are out there. Um, both of them 
have been very actively seeking accessibility feedback right from the earliest stages. And they've been very receptive and open to us coming in and saying, wow, you just did that completely wrong and that's terrible and we can't believe you did that. Of course, we were nicer than that when <laughs> those things came up. But they, re they received that kind of feedback with grace and took it and learned from it and worked on better ways. And I think that the projects, not only did the projects grow, but Drupal as a whole is growing because of that kind of interaction. And so that's where Drupal has room to get even better and, and do better. Awesome. So I think uh, along those same lines, um, if somebody's building a website, or a developer for a website. Uh, obviously, it's a very big investment to develop a module, to develop a theme. Um, but if, if I'm preparing to build a, a website in Drupal, um, are there any specific modules that you would recommend that would help push somebody in the right direction of a more accessible, compliant website? I, I know it's no substitute for you know all the other things, but are there other modules that kind of help usher in the right direction? Yeah, so uh, the core maintainers are trying to do an audit now to review the current state of some of the modules that have in the past been uh, been good ones. And uh, there are there's a module right now that's relatively new. I don't know. It might still be under review. Um, that's a decorative images, I think it's called. And um, I'm just making sure that I can refer here to some things that are listed. Um, so the module that's fairly new for decorative images will allow you to indicate if an image should have alt text or not, so that when a content editor is adding content, because you know, we build Drupal sites and then we pass them off to content editors and they break everything that we tried to do to make it accessible. Um, but you you want to make sure that you're forcing content editors to typically put alt text into images, but sometimes images that content editors put in shouldn't have alt text. So to use that module to make that indication and make that easier, um, that's, that's definitely one module. There's a module that's recently been contributed called Editorially. Uh, editory A11Y. Uh, and that's a interesting one to help, again, to help your content contributors to start to see where they are not making accessible contributions when they enter their, their content into the page and where their content entry might actually be breaking accessibility. Other sort of best practices to think about when you're building a Drupal site, so as a, as a builder rather than a, a developer, is to think about using things like Layout Builder that have gone through a lot of accessibility review already and can help you structure what gets put into the site, by, again, by your content contributors in very specific ways so that you maintain good semantic structure even when your content contributors start entering things into the content. And that's really, so, you know, you can build a beautifully accessible site um, and turn it over to the client or whoever's going to add that content. But if you don't think about what happens, what, what you're building for those content, content contributors and making sure that when they enter that content, it's very structured and very segmented. And that, you know, any kind of, tool that you put in there sort of helps them continue to structure and segment that content hmm. and maintain good semantic markup, then you're creating a situation where once your site goes into its sort of overall life, whatever's going to happen with it, it will break no matter what you did to try to create something accessible. So, so is it fair to say that on the, the blob versus structured content debate, accessibility advocates fall on the structured content side? Absolutely. Imagine. Structured content is so important. <laughs> it helps you put in more semantic markup. It helps you prevent bad code from getting into the content that's being put in there. And then it also helps, it's 
structured content on, and really kind of chunking things out into smaller bits is exceptionally helpful when you get into the cognitive space where people may have challenges uh, with uh, the wall of text, that sort of overwhelming blah that sits in front of you and you just don't even know what you're looking at anymore because you can't figure out what's what. Hmm. It's interesting, interesting. Um, because we often, when when I uh, used to work more on projects that were were accessibility focused, we we they, people would always say, "Hey, we want this level of accessibility," and I would say, "Okay, that's good. We can deliver that on day one, but on day twenty, after your content editors have edited content, added images, done all of these things, like the system will be built." to try to help you with this. Um, but there's no guarantee that it will still pass on day, you know, even day two after you've been, been in there and editing content. I'm wondering, we talked more, we talked about kind of the technical side of it and that there are modules and structured content can help content editors. But I'm wondering if you have any tips for like, just the, like the content, like the content editor themselves to like try to avoid, you know, making content inaccessible. Yes. The first kind of big tip that is so often dismissed even today is to not put text into images. Mm -hmm. So um, to, you know, if you're uploading information or you're creating a page about an event or um, something, that you have this beautiful elaborate flyer for, that flyer, great. It can be added as an extra piece of information on the page, but all of that information that's in that flyer needs to be in there as text. Mm -hmm. And ideally the person who developed that site will have created the proper fields in the outset for the event date, mm -hmm. the event location, um, and made sure that they're coded so that when somebody aims to put them into their calendar, the information transfers over correctly. Uh, and that you as the content editor are using those fields that your developer has hopefully provided for you that are properly mapped and that you place that information very specifically into those fields and mm -hmm. not into just a text field. That's probably the most important advice. So Beyond I, I, I want to yeah. just dig in there for one second, because obviously like text and images, bad, bad idea, right? Mm -hmm. But um, what about PDFs? Because I've, I've, I've seen accessible and non-accessible PDFs and we don't need to go down the media rabbit hole here, but I just think, you know, PDFs or something like somebody posts it and just assumes that it's going to be accessible for folks, right? Yes, that's a really good question. PDF accessibility is really difficult. It is possible to create accessible PDFs. It is a lot of work and it's less work, believe me, it is less work to put that content into a text field or a series of text fields in mm -hmm. your Drupal node form than it is to actually go through and make your PDF properly accessible. You also have to have proprietary software in order to truly make an accessible PDF. You have to have Acrobat Pro. If you do not have Acrobat Pro, then the PDF that you are creating will not be truly accessible, period. Yeah. That is just not, there's, there's currently, to my knowledge, maybe, maybe something's come up in the last six or seven months since I last looked, but there is really no other way. So um, mm -hmm. because it is, you know, it, people, may think it's easier to do it in the PDF because that's kind of comfortable and, and you can control a PDF and, and exactly what the layout looks like. And there's, there's a, a lot of sort of satisfaction in that, but it is really hard to make PDFs accessible. So it's so much easier to just put it into your, into your Drupal form, which means that you're hoping that your developer has created a Drupal node form that makes it easy for you and that streamlines that effort. And so that's that's actually an area where there's a huge intersection between the developer and the content editor. Uh, the developer can truly help the content editor continue to make accessible content by just making it as easy as possible. Consider that your content editors themselves may be people with cognitive differences. 
they may need certain adaptive supports. They may be using assistive technology in order to enter that content. And if you've made it so hard for them that they can't do that, then they might just upload a PDF because it doesn't, it, it's not easy enough for them to go through that form and put the right information. Maybe the labels aren't clear enough or the labels are missing. I used to do VPAT audits and I found missing labels on pretty much every audit I did on forms. It's really common, even though you think it's obvious, it's really common as a developer to mistakenly miss a label because you're trying to make it look like the design. Um, hmm. That so was a very it, roundabout answer to your question. Uh, oh, it was great. <laughs> yeah, no, that's fine. Um, extending that, uh, John's question a little bit in your last comment here a little bit more. What are what are some of the most common missteps by developers that we we should watch out for? I mean, you just mentioned labels on form elements, but I imagine there's dozens. <laughs> Maybe we can get the top couple. Yes, I suspect that most of them come from trying to make some trying to make a visual designer happy. Um, to be to be frank. Um, where Noted. It, it, don't make designers <laughs> happy. Got it. <laughs> well, no, that's, that's, I mean, I am a designer, obviously I, I want you to follow my specifications, although I'm not a visual designer, I'm an interaction designer, but, um, but what happens is as a developer, I, you know, I, this used to happen to me too. It was a, a very kind of natural thing where you see the visual designs in front of you and you want to make sure that you're following what you see on the page and you're having so much trouble doing it. So you start using CSS to change the order of things. Um, and I have one example from a VPAT audit where a developer did exactly that. They, they used CSS to reorder items on the page for a form. And what happened was the submit button was actually before the final two questions in the form in the document object model. And then the developer used the CSS to visually place it at the end. And those two final fields in that form were required fields. So as a screen reader user, or if you were using a certain degree of magnification on your screen, you might never actually know about those last two fields and you would never be able to submit the form. This, this is a real example, I'm not making this up. And this was actually for an essential service as well. So it was for something that people uh, experiencing this, it, it could have been fairly catastrophic for them to be unable to fill out that form. Um, so that's so a really common one. Just wanna let our listeners know, uh, a VPAT is a uh, voluntary product accessibility template. Um, and it typically, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, experts, but it typically outlines um, any, any issues or, or uh, areas where um, something may or may not um, comply to the 508 standard. Is that pretty accurate? That is accurate. And that word voluntary is uh, is a funny one because it is voluntary for everyone unless you're trying to work with a government organization, mm -hmm. in which case it will be required. Uh, there are equivalent VPAT forms uh, for the European Union, uh, for many of the APAC countries as well. Uh, and sometimes those forms can be interchangeable. But uh, yes, they, they typically follow WCAG 2.0 mm -hmm. and are looking at level A and level double A compliance, which I think it's also important at this point to note that even level double A compliance or conformance, it's not technically called compliance, um, even level double A conformance is minimum, absolute bare minimum you can do for accessibility. Um, anything that's in WCAG is, uh, is in there because it's testable, it's easily testable, and it can meet a certain uh, kind of conformance, uh, or sorry, not conformance, consensus in approval. So mm -hmm. that means, that truly means, and I can't express this enough, this is the bare minimum. It does not mean that your site or your product is usable. 
by people using assistive technology. It just means that it maybe will be uh, given a pass in a court of law. Yeah, I've um, I've heard. I don't. I, I've never actually had litigation around this, but I've heard that um, meeting that bare minimum and having a a well written VPAT will get you out of most of the um, uh, kind of frivolous lawsuits that people try to bring um, uh, um, in front of uh, two companies um, around accessibility. I mean, I, I would just argue that those lawsuits aren't frivolous, but <laughs> I agree with the rest of your comment. Uh, okay, uh, let me reiterate or, or uh, edit what I just said. Um, you know, there are some valid lawsuits, but there are also bad actors out there that bring um, invalid or or just try to sue somebody to, um, to, to get money. Basically, what I'm saying is companies do the right thing and make your site accessible for everybody. Um, so that way you can avoid litigation and feel better about yourself at the end of the day. I think that this is a good conversation, though, because um, it's something to keep in mind that a lot of these lawsuits, even if they seem frivolous, these are how advocates are making change. So there are, you you are correct, there are bad actors out there who have uh, less than um, top quality motives. But for the most part, this action, this legal action and litigation is how change is made. And it's the reason why accessibility in, in my own career, I've been able to go from the person that everybody says, yeah, 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 okay, whatever, we'll get to it later, and, and kind of mocks me for bringing it up over and over again or gets annoyed with me, to somebody that people are actually coming to for advice in the very early stages, because now people are aware <laughs> and they care. And I think, unfortunately, <laughs> the lawsuits, even the frivolous ones, are really some of the, the biggest drivers in making that happen. Yeah. It is true, unfortunately, in business, a lot of times you have to hit people in the wallet before they they start to make change. Maybe uh, don't clog the legal system or make lawyers rich, just make an accessible <laughs> website. <laughs> I yeah. love it. Um, you were asking about big, uh, really common mistakes, and there are a couple others that I would love to mention because I think they'll help a lot, a lot of people. So, um, you know, messing with the document object model, huge one. Don't mess with the document object model. Um, so that was that was already mentioned. The DOM. Um, another really big one is using CSS to create styles for things that should be headers or sections rather than using section, you know, using sort of divs and, and, um, and paragraphs and then marking them up with attributes um, with, with CSS and, and such, instead of actually just using headers and the appropriate header order is also a big interference with accessibility. Uh, people who are using assistive technology rely heavily on that header structure in order to get themselves through the content mm -hmm. and through the material that you're providing. Um, they're also very critical wayfinding tools for people using assistive technology in, in terms of locating things on a page, locating critical information, even things like finding your contact form the header structure is essential to that. So that's a big one that I continually found. And then another really big and very, I don't know, silly one that seems super small, but it's it's huge. And I was pretty much guaranteed to find it every single time is putting outline none into your CSS. Be and again, this one I think typically goes back to trying to make a visual designer happy because the browser default for focus indicators is often not very pretty and it's not what the designer likes. So what happens is that uh, developers will write into the CSS outline none so that that outline goes away when something, when a field or, or a button or something receives focus and forget to make sure that other focus indicators are in place. 
or maybe make sure that there's focus indicators for the things that were spelled out in the designs, but forgetting that there's other things that might receive focus. And now you've completely, for those things that, you know, you might just forget to test or not notice or that weren't spelled out in designs, you never actually go back and make sure that those have clear focus indicators as well. And if somebody doesn't know where they're focused on the page, if they're using a switch device or if they're using magnification, or if they're using some other tool that doesn't really make it easy for them to see exactly what that active item is, then really bad things can happen. Um, they could submit early, they could make a mistake in a form, they could, so they could lose the page. Um, something else could happen depending on what you have going on. So that's a, that's a huge one. And I was pretty much guaranteed to find that every time. I wouldn't be surprised if listeners of this podcast go back and look and see, do I have outline none and, or outline zero in my CSS? And probably most listeners will find it. And sometimes getting uh, stuck in a loop or a trap of some sort, right? Yeah. Yeah. So uh, kind of talking a little bit about, you know, the structure of things, we, we've talked a lot about HTML, we mentioned uh, ARIA, but we, we can't neglect JavaScript. It's such a ubiquitous component. Um, to most web pages, can that help or hurt accessibility? Both. <laughs> <laughs> it can help and it can hurt. Um, I think one of the big things to make sure is if you're using JavaScript, to make sure that both your input and output modalities from your code uh, are inclusive. So that you're not writing on click events but instead that you're including, even if it's not a mouse click or a hover, if there's some other, if you know, if there's some other way that a user is engaging, they're not mouse users, are you sure that whatever their press event is, that it triggers the same action as uh, a click or a hover might trigger? And the same is true for outputs. If you have um, if if whatever you're creating, whatever your code is doing, if a sound is your important output when, when you have JavaScript working and it's, it's a sound event or some kind of a change event that happens, that you're not necessarily just relying on somebody being able to see or hear what's happened, that you've created some other mechanism uh, you know, if you're talking about a mobile device, you have access to haptic feedback that can also give somebody information. Uh, so that's an option. But then now we get into it being really important to adhere to personalization uh, because something like haptic feedback uh, means motion of the phone, of the, of the device. And for somebody who is um, experiencing chronic pain, for example, that haptic feedback, that shaking motion uh, can cause pain. So you wanna make sure that if the user's preferences on their device or whatever they're using are set to reduce vibration, uh, to reduce motion, to reduce sound, <laughs> um, to use different color scheme, to use different fonts, that whatever you've coded respects those user changes and, um, and that you're not creating, you know, in, in trying to offer different modalities so that people who experience the world differently through different senses can still experience and, and understand your, your JavaScript events or whatever other events you're creating. Um, but you're also ensuring that you're not doing harm for those for whom those experiences might also be difficult. Interesting. I, I imagine if you have an event that's triggered um, like a modal form or something like that, you really do need to shift focus over to those things as well. And uh, I don't know if that's necessarily always the case. Correct. That's a really important one. That's also a common accessibility fail in VPAT audit. So when, uh, when you have a modal or something that opens up from some kind of a, a press or click or, or uh, actuation event, your focus needs to shift into that modal and it needs to be trapped in that modal. You know, we often talk about focus traps as being a bad thing, but in this case, you actually do want to trap the focus in that modal because if you don't, 
you could cause the user to be interacting with things behind what's visually forward on the screen. And then they're going to be super confused and not know what is going on if they're not able to see what's happening. Hmm. Um, so you trap the focus in the modal until the point at which the user dismisses the modal. And then you return the focus to where they came from. And this is also really important. Don't return them to the top of the page, because then you're going to make them go through those 80 presses again. Uh, return them uh, to where yeah. they just came from when they dismiss the modal, and then they can continue from there. Thank you. Wow. That, the, I, this episode has given, uh, hopefully it's given everybody so much to think about. Um, I would like to remind our listeners, uh, disclaimer, we are not legal experts. Um, we do have some accessibility experts with us, but we are not legal experts. So always, always consider, uh, uh, you know, consult a lawyer if you have any uh, legal issues or questions. Um, in closing, uh, Rain, it's been Awesome having you with us. I'm wondering um, if there's anything else you'd like to add before we close out the show. I think I'd, I'd just like to add that this is a human rights issue. I, I don't think I can say that enough. And not only is it a human rights issue, but it's a human rights issue for one in four people in the world. That is a massive number. So next time you're trying to argue for the right finances and the right consideration to go towards the hours needed to write good code, you have that number at your discretion. These, this data is widely available on the UN sites, on the World Health Organization sites. It's easy to get to. And you can just put that data in front of your uh, the project manager, whoever is, is managing that budget and the amount of time that you're able to spend and say, look, if we don't do this, we're leaving out one in four people. And that's huge. Yeah, yeah that's, that's a surprising statistic. Well, Rain, thank you for joining us. It's been a great topic. I have a lot of thinking to do. I, you know, I try to make accessible projects, but I think there's, I'm sure there's a couple of things that you mentioned today that I will find on some of my projects. So I think I'm going to do some some digging over the next week or so. Uh, for our listeners, do you have questions or feedback? You can reach out to Talking Drupal on Twitter with the handle Talking Drupal or via email at show at talkingdrupal.com. And you can connect with our hosts and other listeners on Drupal Slack in the Talking Drupal channel. If you're interested in the show news and updates, you can sign up for a newsletter at talkingdrupal.com slash newsletter. You can promote your camp on Talking Drupal. Learn more at talkingdrupal.com slash camp promo. And thank you patrons for supporting Talking Drupal. Your support is greatly appreciated. You can learn more about becoming a patron at talkingdrupal.com and choosing the become a patron button. And Rain, if our listeners wanted to get in touch with you, what's the best way to do that? They can email me. Um, actually, I think the best way is through Twitter, uh, Rain Bria, R-A-I-N, Bria, B-R-E-A-W, is my handle on Twitter. Thank you. And Chad, how about you? Yeah, yeah. So I'm also on Twitter. It's Chad K. Hester. And on LinkedIn, same thing, Chad K. Hester. Uh, Chad Hester on Drupal.org. Um, and uh, as an agency person with... Uh, ImageX, we are really upping our accessibility game. So if you want to build more accessible, compliant websites, let us know. And John, how about you? You can find me on all the major social networks at John Picozzi, as well as Drupal.org. And you can find about uh, find out about EPAM at epam.com. And you can reach me pretty much everywhere at NixVan, N-I-C-X-V-A-N. And of course, if you've enjoyed listening, we've enjoyed talking. See Have a good one, week. everyone. Take care.